Uh, show us some good clusters, that is to say, intra-regional or inter-regional networks of R&D institutes and firms. Show us a plan for upgrading and developing those regions, and we'll fund it. So the prefects of the regions had to go out and um, s submit their own call uh, for proposals locally. Uh, the regions collected 105 proposals altogether, uh, sent them up to Paris, where they were evaluated by a panel of 30 experts, mainly scientific experts. Uh, but it was the national government, uh, specifically an interministerial commission, uh, that selected 67 of these competitive clusters. And as you see here, uh, Paris was not the, the, the winning region. Uh, in fact, uh, the winner wasn't Paris, it was Lyon. And uh, if you look at the, in, in the southeast, where that largest circle is, uh, there were 15 clusters that were selected in the region of Rhône-Alpes. And uh, the region of Rhône-Alpes, with its uh, medium-sized firms in, in Lyon, uh, that region has long uh, militated for more autonomy in economic planning, and it's getting it, as are the other regions. If you'd like to if you're curious about the types of clusters uh, that are being funded, well, here's a list uh, of the competitive polls, sorry, the polls of competitiveness in Rhone Alp. And you see there, um, they're funding everything from medical research uh, to sports goods. And uh, so these policies don't aim at uh, creating new clusters. The clusters already exist. Rather, they aim at upgrading existing clusters uh, and building the clusters within the country and even internationally. Uh, nothing specifically French in this. The OECD calls this uh, decentralized collaborative governance in which money, calls for proposals, and incentives to network uh, come down from the French state. But ideas, self-promotion, and the execution uh, of, of economic initiatives uh, are, are, are more bottom-up. And by the way, um, the, the nurturing of clusters does shed some light on uh, the protection of national champions in France. Turning now to Germany, uh, Germany is a slightly different case. Um, traditionally, uh, Germany has not relied on the state uh, to develop uh, new sources of comparative advantage. That was more the business of industry and industry associations of banks, unions, uh, um, semi-public organizations. And uh, essentially, the planning-heavy German system was very effective for nurturing major export um, sectors in areas like automotive, machine tools, chemical, pharmaceutical, uh, industrial electronics, what we would call medium tech industries. And Germany has long been a, a, a very large uh, exporter, and especially those industries. Um, so what's the problem? Uh, the problem, in a word, is jobs. Uh, the industries that I just show you do not generate much new employment. Uh, and this is very well known uh, in Germany. Um, and if you look at uh, my statistics or OECD statistics, you will see that Germany has a serious trade and patent deficits in uh, high-tech sectors like IT, like semiconductors, like biotechnology, even optics and new materials. Uh, the federal government in Germany has been trying to do something about that for a long time, since the 1960s, uh, without much success. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of these disappointing policies results. I just want to point out that Germany structurally does not really have, at the federal level, the levers that it needs to change its sources of uh, comparative advantage. Uh, the by constitution and by habit, the ministries are quite autonomous. So the federal chancellor does not tell the ministers what to do. She doesn't and she can't. Um, so that means there is not a great deal of coordination among ministries uh, at the federal level. Uh, the, if we look at uh, that first ministry on the left in green, Ministry for Education and Research, it can fund R&D projects. It can't do much more than that. Um, whereas the Federal Economics Ministry, in green on the right, has always been traditionally rather la laissez-faire, and it has uh, been very skeptical of efforts by the research ministry or by other ministries uh, to try to sponsor new industries. That's very different, however, at the state level, that is, the so-called lender uh, in Germany. 
Um, the German states are far more autonomous than the regions that you see in France, and some of them, like Bavaria, regard themselves practically as sovereign countries. Um, so that means that a state premier like Edmund Stoiber of Bavaria um, has a lot, has the latitude to govern with a very strong hand, will have personal contacts to local industry leaders, and by the way, the German states do run their own colleges and universities. Um, okay, uh, since at least the 1980s, certain German states have implemented their own industrial policies, and that's sometimes been called the mitization of uh, lender and industrial policies. Uh, now, if we see that term, you would ask the question, well, who's meeting in the German states? And the answer is very simple. It's the state premier. It's the state premier and his or her own um, political dynasty, which has very close contacts to industry and will listen to industry. So as we'll see on the next slide, Bavaria has poured billions uh, into the sponsorship of, of high technology. Uh, who did it? Uh, certainly not the parliament, not the ministers. It really is just Edmund Stoiber, Edmund Stoiber himself uh, relying on a privy council of about a dozen experts. And so Edmund Stoiber said, uh, here's the money that we're going to spend on high-tech parliament, this is what we're going to do, and they did it. And of course in Bavaria it helps if you have a, a party majority and sort of one party hegemony. So let's look at what Bavaria did. Uh, Bavaria, as I said, has, has invested massively in high technology. Uh, the first initiative um, dates from 1994, the future of Bavaria Offensive, where Stoiber took 2.9 billion euros of money raised from privatization of Bavarian state firms and invested it in R&D centers, <coughs> um, technology parks, starting incubators and the like across quite a wide range of technology fields. Uh, in the second phase, which is called the high-tech offensive. By the way, that's not English, that's the German original, high-tech offensiva. Uh, another 1.35 billion euros were raised from privatization and invested in R&D. This time there was a track record showing that life, the life sciences firms, especially the biotechnology firms, were doing well. So a lot more of that funding went into the life science. Uh, then in this year, there's a new cluster initiative. It's only 50 million dollars, uh, sorry, 50 million euros, uh, but it, it's good for propaganda and publicity. And now they're into clusters as well. So clusters is sort of the, the uh, what's in fashion uh, in old Europe, you might say. Now summing up, um, we see that uh, the nurturing of comparative advantages has been increasingly delegated to regional and local levels. Um, there's an emphasis on making selective R&D investments and in targeting local sources of industrial um, excellence for upgrading in, in, in clusters. Um, what can we learn uh, from France and Germany, and this isn't on the slide, but I would just note in parentheses, well, what we can learn is not to repeat their mistakes. Both France and Germany have fossilized higher education systems. They have national science systems that don't have enough openness and competition, so certainly we, we, would, we would want to learn from the mistakes in uh, Germany and France. If I think uh, more positively about what we might learn, um, uh, I live in Rhode Island, I work in Massachusetts, those two state economies have completely interwoven economies and yet there is almost no coordination of economic planning. So one idea to consider, for example, is a multi-state uh, cluster, which you might call the New England Poles of Competitive Initiative. There it is. Thank you very much.
profits for capital, uh, for labor, for commodities. There's been a push to uh, stronger anti antitrust, although not too strong. Uh, if we compare Japan with the United States, we, we see, however, a lot of, a lot of lingering mercantilism. Um, so I'm going to talk about, um, talk about the, the Japanese approach to creating and, and uh, preserving uh, comparative advantage. There certainly are policy, uh, can you read policies for promoting particular industries. The industrial revitalization law has been important about put money into, into old industries to help firms in those, in those industries put money in, in, in the old industries themselves and in new areas. Uh, there's been money for investment in new industries. Japan also has a regional cluster plan. It hasn't been as central as it had, uh, to, to policy as it has been in Western Europe. Japan has uh, emphasized Tar targeting particular um, industries and technologies. There's been a lot of, uh, the United States has been very much uh, the benchmark uh, of, of success for, for, the, for Japan. Uh, a couple of policies uh, called E-Japan, U-Japan, again, these are the originals, uh, uh, have uh, attempted to, to help Japan catch up with the United States in in uh, the use of the internet. Uh, E-Japan first pushing the uh, promotion of uh, fast access to, to the internet. Japan uh, put money into expanding, uh, ex expanding its fiber optic networks. Uh, then switched to U-Japan, ubiquitous Japan, uh, emphasis on on pushing smart tag technology, that all that all commodities would have a little, uh, a little code in them that could, that could be tracked easily. Uh, the government very much was uh, behind these policies to uh, to help the to help Japan innovate in ways that would that would enable it to, to catch up with the United States. One thing that Japan has uh, been very aware of is, uh, is is dependence on the United States for information technology, especially software from Microsoft. A, a lot of awareness of of Microsoft's monopoly concern with this and uh, big government push to try to develop alternative software. And what's been interesting in just the last few years is that there's been a, a kind of a push to a, a, a sort of quasi EU in East Asia. I mean, and, and like the EU, just as the EU put France and Germany together, uh, sworn enemies a few decades ago, uh, here there is a, a push to, to bring the People's Republic of China. Uh, Japan, South Korea together. We, we read in the newspapers all the time about lingering problems over World War II that uh, these countries still have. However, there have been close talks for the last several years uh, between these countries on, on challenging the United States monopoly in, in software. Uh, on the Japanese side, this has meant bringing together uh, uh, Japan's leading, uh, uh, leading firms, uh, such as Hitachi, Sony, etc., to come together on information technology, uh, to meet regularly with Chinese and Koreans to develop the, the uh, technology. A number of agreements have been worked out in, in a wide variety of uh, technology areas. There is also uh, it's the, the typical old Japanese model. There uh, is a, uh, a quasi-government agency that then promotes these this new software, these new technologies throughout Asia, Southeast Asia, South Asia, uh, East Asia. Uh, uh, Japan has also used important policy to help industries scrap and scrap and build. And this looks like pretty old, pretty old fashioned <laughs> industrial policy. And, and a lot of what I want to communicate today is that Japan, although there's been a big push to liberalization, if we compare Japan today with Japan of 1990, Japan does look pretty similar. However, if we compare Japan with the United States or even with Europe, we still see a lot of mercantilism. So really a lot of what I want to say today is, is a warning that Japan is still doing this. Japan has not had the last, uh, you know, has not had a decade of great, uh, great success. I think there are a lot of warnings of what not to do. Uh, we look at um, 
for instance, the steel industry. Japan is it's a lot of the same old stuff. I, I follow the steel industry. I look at these numbers every year, and they, they still hold on with this old cartel. They pushed, they pushed a merger between the two big firms, but that's been the, the only difference. Uh, Medi con continues to, to monitor, this, um, monitor this cartel. Uh, Medi, this is, uh, Medi says that this is, that this is new thinking that there is a strategic vision for steel. Uh, it is a key input for autos, and the auto industry is, is pretty happy to have, have these arrangements in steel. Medi says it, it, that steel is a high-value industry, and, and Japan has a state-of-the-art steel industry. It's got a terrific steel industry. Steel is, nevertheless, a pretty low-growth industry. Uh, uh, we, can see that, we can see the effects in in Japan's trade profile. Japan doesn't import much, much steel. There are still lots of informal barriers to trade. I've gone to Europe and talked to people about the, about the comparisons between the two places, and, and Japan just has a, a tighter lock on markets than, than Europe does. Uh, the, the European countries import a lot of steel. There's a lot of support between each other, but even the EU as a whole imports a lot of steel. The US imports a lot of steel. Japan, Japan doesn't. Um, uh, there are informal agreements with Europe, with Asia, uh, to, to, keep, to, to, to keep the steel out in addition to having domestic controls. Not a great recipe for success. This is what Japan keeps doing. Uh, autos. Uh, like Toyota likes stable ties with its, uh, with its suppliers. Uh, it's happy to have stable relations in in uh, with with steel firms, uh, I think the auto industry is is a, is a famous example of a case where industrial policy, sort of hardcore pushy industrial policy from Meti, wasn't important and and still is is is, is not the certainly not the key explanation of why the industry has done so well. I think we think about an important industrial policy in autos that makes that that gives the Japanese auto industry a base for being for being competitive and forward-looking around the world, it's that they have an energy policy. Uh, they, there is a, uh, what by European standards is a modest gasoline tax. Nevertheless, they have a tax on gasoline. Uh, the United States has virtually no tax on gasoline. And we think it's quite, quite remarkable that we can come up with the collective gumption, bravery, to actually go invade Iraq and occupy it, but somehow can't, can't do that to tax ourselves on gasoline. Uh, I, 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 um, when we think about what we could do to help our industry compete, compete better and look farther ahead, I think that we certainly could look to the Japanese, Japanese model here. Um, if we look at Japan overall, Japan is not a very globalized place. Um, again, Japan has changed a lot over the last 15 years, but in international terms, uh, Japan, Japan talks about uh, wanting foreign direct investment, and there's, been, there's a little bit more than there used to be, but still not very much. Uh, foreign affiliates in Japan, don't, they're not very important, they don't produce very much, they don't give much competition to, to domestic Japanese firms. Uh, thinking again about this, the, the steel industry, uh, although on a broad general level, Meti says, oh, they've just been waving the pom-poms for, for foreign direct investment. However, when it comes to what they still see as a, as a key strategic industry, they've been very wary of, oh my god, what if Mittal Steel did what it, it, it came to Japan and did what it did in, in Europe and, and bought out one of our steel, steel firms and shook up our cartel? That would be terrible. And they've, they've been very active with the steel industry to, to prevent that. Um, so, again, not a model. Uh, Japan still doesn't import much. Um, imports are up um, in the last 10 years to 12%, but still behind the U.S., even though Japan is, of course, on the doorstep of the workshop of the world in China and South Korea. Uh, even though Japan, of course, is, is a much smaller economy than the U.S., we would expect higher levels of trade. Um, so, again, not a model there. The U.S. response to Japan. Well, just in, in, in for, for the examples that I've given, we still are the benchmark for tele, telecommunications technologies. We do very well because we have a more we have a more open economy. Japan is great at certain things. Certainly, if you go to Tokyo, you'll be very impressed by the cell phones 
uh, everybody in Tokyo is, you know, is constantly doing everything on their cell phone. It re really is quite remarkable. Uh, Japan has not been able to sell these cell phones anywhere else. They cost a fortune. Uh, the rest of the world is not willing to buy them. The idea in, 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 in uh, getting together with China and South Korea is the old thing of China's got an enormous market. If we could get our technologies into China and figure out how to sell there, we could then have a basis for our technologies possibly being standard throughout the world. So that's the hope. But, uh, but I, again, Japan has not, has not figured out how to come up with technologies that sell well in other, in other advanced industrialized countries. Uh, we look at, uh, we, we can complain about uh, informal protection of the, uh, the steel market or other markets. You know, there have been attempts to sort of work through the WTO on these sorts of things. It doesn't really work. I think there's not much point. Um, we have, you know, in the United States, we have contracted our, our, our steel industry and our economy overall has done much better than Japan. Uh, I think that, that our ideas are to build our existing strengths in education and innovation. Again, Japan looks to the United States. Japan has a terrific uh, lower grade educational system. I've had my own kids in a number of grades in Japan. It's, uh, it is quite wonderful in a lot of ways, I think to a great degree because teachers are paid very well in Japan. They get, they get great talent in the Japanese education system. Uh, at, the, at the university level, Japan is looking to the United States to see how it, it could build universities that would, that would uh, prepare students better for innovation, uh, that would work more closely with, with, uh, with entrepreneurs to develop technologies that, that could succeed in world markets. Uh, I think the one key area where we have a lot to learn from Japan is in energy policy. Although there, although there are constantly complaints about some, 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 some unfortunate uh, environmental policies in Japan. Japan likes, and the Japanese like to kill whales, uh, eat whale meat, meat. <coughs> um, that's too bad, but um, on a broader level, Japan is very responsible on energy policy and it helps their industry. I think it's really something to, to learn from. I think it's unfortunate. We're talking about ways that we could innovate, but if gas taxes are off the table. I will stop there. I'm going to talk about uh, the United Kingdom and Ireland. And compared to Japan, uh, Germany, and France, I mean, this is much more familiar to a U.S. audience because the extent of uh, central direction planning and so forth is, is, is very much less. So just a few statistics. Uh, GDP is about the same as France, 75% of Germany. We've got GDP per capita there. The old industries are in decline, and the UK is not trying to rescue them the way they are in Japan. 
the performance in the last decade, I think it's well known, has been better in the UK than Germany or France. Uh, in terms of GDP, about 1% faster, but probably more importantly for most people, unemployment is quite modest in the UK. It's about our level, whereas in France and Germany it's quite high. Um, foreign, you can't read the bottom part, but the foreign direct investment stock in the UK is about 30%, uh, about 40% in the UK, and it's only about 18% uh, in Germany and 30% in France. So the UK has been, and I think this is again well known, a magnet for inward investment in amongst the major countries in Europe. Now, I just want to talk about uh, two things in, in the UK which have been sparkling. And the first is finance, which of course builds on a very old tradition. And open capital markets and uh, older people in this room like Tian and myself remember <laughs> how the US helped uh, London get going with our interest equalization tax in the, in the Kennedy era gave a big spark to the London financial markets. Uh, but uh, if we come more recently in the United States, just the last 10 or 15 years, as is well known, we've got quite a bit of regulation in this country over financial markets, and now we have a governor of New York who got there kind of on the back of, uh, of imposing himself in the New York financial markets. And the, the, the model in London is just very different. Um, Lloyd's reorganized itself uh, a while back. Uh, there is a very simplified uh, regulatory system, the Financial Services Authority, which is broad control over banks and stock exchange and so forth in, in the UK. And uh, this favorable environment has led to a dominant position in, in Europe and second only to New York in the world in, uh, in markets and in some places more dominant than, than, the, uh, than the New York market, uh, which is remarkable when we consider that, uh, of course, the currency in, in Britain is still uh, the pound sterling and the rest of, well, most of the rest of Europe has gone to the euro and that was thought, well, maybe that'd be a disadvantage. Turned out to be no disadvantage at all. They could do everything in euros just as well as they can, in fact, better than they can in Frankfurt or Paris. So you get this whole range of um, areas where, uh, you know, the London market is, is actually uh, uh, central to the, to the world. And uh, what this has led to is an enormous cluster of financial talent in London, which feeds on itself. So you speak of clusters, this is far more successful than anything France has created or I would, I would, pre would predict will create, certainly in anything to do with finance or uh, Japan. I mean, they can have all these novel ideas, but uh, here it really, it really does work. Um, you know, now what is the policy? Well, I think the regulation and the, and the, the big bang, if you recall that, which was a dramatic step about a decade and a half ago, uh, <clears throat> really uh, got rid of a lot of uh, old uh, fixed price uh, trade barriers between different financial firms and so forth. That was very important back in the Thatcher era. Uh, current regulation is quite good. And you have all these uh, foreign banks there, which are quite welcome. And the other thing which is friendly, which I think does deserve note, is that the taxation of individuals in Britain who are citizens abroad is quite friendly in the sense that their foreign investment income is not taxed by Britain. Now, they're earnings in, in, in the financial markets are, but a lot of these people, of course, have wealth abroad and that's not taxed. So it's regarded as quite a friendly financial uh, system for tax purposes by these financiers. Now what else in Britain might you know, possibly rank with what was uh, talked about in, uh, in these other European countries in Japan? Well, there is Silicon Fen, 
But you cannot find policies that grow silicon fan. Silicon fan is, you could say, uh, you have, of course, the brilliance of Cambridge. You have the proximity to London, which is critical. And it's only an hour, an hour and a half trip. You have all these firms which have developed since I was a graduate student there. Um, what did the colleges do? And some of the colleges are quite rich. They did very little. Uh, they provided, St. John's provided a little attempt at an industrial park or something. It was of no consequence. Uh, but you get this tremendous employment in firms. And uh, so again, it, you, you can't really say the state was a driver of this, probably any more than you can say that the state of California drove Silicon Valley. Well, um, now let's see if we can move on without uh, killing it. I actually had some more slides, but uh, they may have disappeared from this. This shows these technology problems. Yeah, I had a couple of slides on uh, on uh, Ireland, but I'll just talk them through because they didn't make it over, apparently. Oh, yeah, there was a new one in Ireland that came over. They're not there. Uh, since they're not there, I have a memory stick that takes too much time. So let's just go for it. Well, there it is. You know. um, let me talk about Ireland. It doesn't really take any slides, so you can just turn this off. Ireland is truly remarkable. It's the best performing economy in the OECD. When I was a student in Cambridge several decades ago, uh, you can imagine the British view towards the Irish. I won't go into it. But it was not, uh, not one of admiration. Uh, times have just completely changed. And so what did the, what did the Irish do? Uh, well, they they, they brought the Washington Consensus before John Williamson thought of the term. They are the model of the Washington Consensus. And there's a complete change in, in macro policy um, from kind of a socialist deficit spending, inflationary policy, all that kind of stuff, way back in the, in the 70s. And they, they switched over from the old, uh, old Irish view towards, uh, you know, the Washington Consensus, so we could call it the Dublin Consensus. And they did some other things, I'm going to come to that, but let me just run through the statistics that I think are important. Uh, the GDP per capita, and it's true, much of that is earned by foreign firms, but it's now about $47,000, whereas the U.S. is 42000 I mean, this is remarkable, and the U.K. is 37000 and the migration, which in my time was always from Ireland to, to Britain, has completely reversed the flow, and people are going back to Ireland, of course, and from abroad as well as from Britain. Unemployment is just amazing. It's 4%. I mean, that is by far the lowest in, in, uh, in Europe. Uh, the uh, foreign direct investment is 126% of GDP. So there it is, and half of that's from the U.S., and the most important sectors are pharmaceuticals, computers, chemicals. Now, they've had a fast economic growth, 10% uh, in the second half of the 1990s, so that was up at the Chinese level, and 6% since 2000, which is very good for a country at this level of economic performance. It's the largest per head exporter of merchandise goods. And it is now getting into the finance. Of course, it's, Dublin is small compared to London, but they're exactly replicating the London model in terms of regulation and doing very well for a small economy. What policies, apart from the, from the, um, from the Washington consensus of the Dublin, the Dublin innovation, what else? The one other thing which is truly important is the low corporate tax rate. It's now 12.5%, it's flat. That is an amazing, I mean, both, both the fact that it's low and it's flat, and you don't need an army of accountants to compute it, and it, uh, it's just a magnet. And it's such a magnet, I mean, this, this I thought was great. Uh, a few days ago, the British said, well, maybe we will do the same tax rate for Northern Ireland to try to get it to catch up with the South. Thank you.
thank you all very much. Um, we have a lot of questions here, which I have just got, so I haven't had a chance to read them. But um, I would like to ask one myself, um, and ask you each to address it. Um, and that is on the question of culture, and business culture. And, um, and also, sort of, I suppose you, you could say political economic culture. Um, but you all, in, in, a, in a funny way, addressed it, but uh, or danced, or, uh, skirted around it. But because it's it's not that concrete, there's no policy. It's hard to do. But I wonder whether you could each talk about what public policies um, either reinforce or don't reinforce um, uh, a culture um, that uh, encourages entrepreneurship or doesn't, innovation or doesn't. Um, uh, hard work, uh, views toward wealth, that sort of thing. Um, because in some ways that tends to be, it's, it's, it's a question of whether the culture comes first or last, but in any case it's, it's part of the dynamic, I think, in each of the countries, uh, whether Japan and the, and the view toward outsiders, um, which gets reflected in their uh, policies, or um, in Ireland where you've had, I think, a, a, a tremendous shift from um, uh, a view of wealth um, uh, as something that is bad and everyone wanting to bring everybody down to sort of celebrating entrepreneurship. And in Europe, um, still some of the same things. But could each of you talk about um, the degree to which you think government um, either um, is trying to change the culture or is reinforcing the bad parts of the of culture in terms of business? <coughs> Yeah, just, just say that. Yeah, um, uh, I, I think government can do a lot to uh, change uh, certain aspects of business culture. Uh, France, but especially Germany, has tried hard in the past decade to create new incentives uh, for individuals and groups to start up their own companies. And so you did have a, a, a high-tech boom in Germany in, in the 1990s uh, when it became easy to start your own company with, and uh, waste other people. So you had a lot of, of uh, high-tech firms getting started up, uh, starting up in the late 90s and going broke in the year 2000, just as you had in the U.S. Um, we, were, we were talking earlier about uh, developing talent, and uh, an enormous concern in Japan is about future talent in the sense that uh, children seem, simply aren't being born. I mean, this is not completely different from Western Europe, but the levels are even lower than in the rich countries in in, in Western Europe. And the, the concern is essentially that, well, Japanese are great at working really hard. Corporate culture about working really hard is, is very strong. And it's so strong that there just really isn't any time to have kids. Uh, women look at, women look at, at, at what a life with, with a Japanese husband is going to be like, and they simply say, I don't, I don't want to do this. If there's a bestseller that said, uh, kek, a big Japanese bestseller, Kekko Shinaide, don't get married. It's awful. Uh, so, and, and the, Jap the Japanese government's worried about, the, worried about this, they've got their, their population policy bureaus, and, uh, but uh, they're also, uh, you know, sort of pushed more national holidays, but uh, they have a very hard time changing this particular culture. As far as, uh, there's also then also the concern of, of innovation and venture capital, and uh, Japanese government's had a hard time figuring out how, 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 to, how to spark that, I think, has not, not successfully figured that out. There certainly has been financial liberalization, and that's, that has that's been helpful. Uh, it's helped Japan move a little bit away from the old rigid, uh, rigid, rigid system, uh, but it's been difficult to change culture otherwise. Uh, well, Steve, just a couple of comments. I think the, the British, even under the old days of socialism, of Wilson and so forth, they, they were never envious of wealth or, you know, that it kind of flattened things out the way you have had in some other countries in Europe and, and so forth. And uh, certainly, since the Thatcher Revolution, Blair has continued to be very, uh, very friendly to wealthy people. Uh, entrepreneurship and so forth, success is celebrated, uh, the Beatles and what have you. And of course, Ireland, as I said, and you mentioned, it flipped completely and has adopted that model. So in that way, the government has been very, uh, very friendly. Where I think the British have signally failed, and I think they recognize this and don't do anything about it, is they have 
two national assets, Oxford and Cambridge, and these are badly neglected. The pay is terrible. People still teach there because uh, the prestige is great. Uh, and they are wrestling with their secondary and primary education system just as we are. So, so that, that is quite a troublesome feature of widely recognized nothing done about it. Any reason why they I mean, it, it seems so obvious to us and probably to most people that they should, you know, help those institutions along the way. Is there, what, is there some sort of political... Um, well, well here's, I, I will just throw out, I don't know what, uh, you know, Jeffrey Sachs or Paul Krugman earned, but I would guess it's three or four hundred thousand dollars a year from those universities. I think for a public university in Britain to pay that kind of salary would be regarded as, I don't know, somewhat scandalous. Um, if a private entrepreneur, as I said, the Beatles or, you know, some of these industrial entrepreneurs make it, you know, a half a billion dollars, a billion dollars, that's, that's fine. Sainsbury, you can go right through the list, the gamblers. Mm -hmm. So, and the financiers, I mean, no financier in the city of London is feels self-respecting unless he's earning a million dollars, seriously. And so, uh, there's just this uh, discrepancy between what you can pay in a public university and what, uh, what the private sector can pay. Um, okay, let me um, read some of your questions. Um, I think this one is for Mark Lehrer. After visiting the Rhone Alps, um, this person says, um, uh, they seem to believe that they can engineer and brand clusters. Should the U.S. invest in regional cluster development or rely on organic evolution? Does geographic proximity matter uh, with global in innovation, um, assets, internet, migration of creative talent? Oh, well, that's a really good question. Um, actually, even if you look at some American clusters, you will see very strong leadership. For example, Silicon Valley uh, is really the product of uh, Frederick Terman at Stanford University, uh, who worked on building up that cluster over a period of decades. So there is a need for some kind of regional leadership in these clusters. Now, whether um, government agencies, as in France, uh, are necessary to produce the best leaders is, a, is an empirical question, and we'll have to see the results of that. As for geographic, uh, importance of geographic uh, proximity in the internet age, uh, there are lots of economists who have been working on that very issue. And they found actually that geographic proximity does matter, especially in highly innovative, fast moving industries. At the same time, because of the internet and, and global communication technologies, uh, and France recognizes this, it is very important to network your clusters uh, with the rest of the world. And I think it's fair to say that one of the reasons um, that proximity still matters. Um, but one of the big reasons is that people like to be with other people who are like themselves and they like to be able to move around firms easily without having to move their families. Um, and that's just a very, um, it's not a very sophisticated explanation for things, but it just turns out that that's the way human be beings behave. Um, and uh, empirically that seems to be an important uh, factor. I would say this is probably for Mark Tilton, um, but anyone else can uh, pipe in. How is Japan doing in terms of its standard of living compared to other countries? Uh, Japan is, is uh, currently it's just about exactly even with uh, France and Germany. Uh, it had, but, but, but Japan's fallen, fallen a bit in sort of relative standing over the last 15 years. Uh, there is, uh, that said, the big concern in Japan really is, is increasing inequality. Concern with uh, um, uh, falling employment for people with with low skills, and so so there's been there has been a shift to a more open market, and there's been a cost in terms of in terms of equality within Japan, and that's the big political concern in Japan. Um, this is probably both for Mark and um, Mark. Uh, does the collaborative state in France? differ in any significant way from the East Asian development states in terms of protecting and nurturing uh, new industries? Well, it's, 
mean, Japan, uh, Japan is different from Europe in that there is, is much more scope uh, for protective measures. Um, that's, that's very different. If you look at, if you compare what, what the Japanese government does and what the European government, uh, the EU does on, on telecommunications, for example, uh, the EU is very active on forcing uh, national National, industry, national industries, national markets to be open. There really is no, there's no corresponding body in, in Japan to, to make sure that openness gets included with new industry plans. I think actually what Mark says applies exactly to the French situation. The French have lost control over their markets and what remains to be seen about these whole regional clusters is are they a, a, a strong, proactive uh, economic measure, or are they really a measure of the government's impotence, really, to uh, um, alter its economic base? Gary, this one's for you. Um, are, is London's success in financial markets um, give other industries in the UK a comparative advantage. In other words, is finance important? Uh, is the is the strength in finance turn out to be important um, source of strength for other industries in the UK? Uh, after the uh, U.S. or maybe equal with the U.S., uh, I think you can raise venture capital more easily in the U.K. than almost any other country. Maybe Australia is as easy, but that would be the one you know, very obvious thing apart from all the employment for the bond traders and, and, and the derivative traders and so forth. Uh, but if you look at the, I mean, let's see, I'm, I'm a believer, though I, I have to admit that the statistics are not terrific on this, but uh, I'm a believer that equity capital is a better driver of innovation than bank finance. And if you look at equity, uh, Flotation relative to GDP or anything else in the UK, it is very high compared to other countries, including the United States. So you have a really an equity-driven uh, economy uh, to a much greater extent, and I do think that's a plus. And Mark, uh, in Germany, of course, they have been trying to develop an equity culture for 10 years, um, and I, it's safe to say it's been a total failure. Um, uh, they were on the way to doing that. Um, they had a uh, small business uh, stock market, which I can't remember what the name of it is, but it's totally collapsed now. Neuer market, um, yeah, collapsed. Uh, because after the after the bust, um, Germans did you know put their feet in the water in terms of owning stock, and a lot of them got burned. Um, my favorite story on that is that a lot of people when they privatized the Deutsche Telekom. You know, it was very. Everyone wanted to get a piece of this, and everyone um, went out and bought stock, and it was very widely held, and everyone was following it in the newspaper, and um, it was, you know, one of the things that was leading the news every night. And then, of course, after the telecom bust, it went down, and there was a serious debate in the uh, in the German Parliament um, about whether the government should um, re recompensate everybody for their losses. <laughs> uh, uh, so obviously. The equity culture and the sort of even the understanding of it didn't take uh, take too much hold there. But um, uh, anyway, that was that's a little bit like getting um, to my point about culture. Um, uh, Gary, the second part of this question is: um, Does the popularity of the LSE for IPOs um, uh, suggest that we have a um, competitive problem? Well, I mean, New York is very strong, obviously, um, but it, there is a Starbucks problem, and, and I think the Senate will address that, and indeed the SEC is, I guess, about to change Regulation 405 and, and make some, uh, some uh, improvements. But, uh, I mean, just to, uh, just to consider what would probably not be acceptable in this country if the um, New York Stock Exchange were to try to buy NASDAQ or vice versa, that would probably be blocked, which does not make any sense in this world because you have competition from London and so forth. So we have, a, we have an antitrust system which is probably not as favorable as in London. And then you do have this duplicative regulation led by 
by New York State and probably others are going to get into it, and I think that's, that is very harmful. Yeah, everyone says, and you have made the point, that the regulatory system is just a lot better. Could you talk a little bit, we have a rules-based system and they have a principle-based principle system. Um, could you explain to me and everyone here what effectively that means? Well, the, the Financial Services Authority, and I wrote a book on this several years ago, but in any event, it has tremendous power to discipline. And as you say, it's, it's written in quite broad terms. We are quite specific in our, in our rules, both at the federal level. And you've got, you've got the Fed, you have the Comptroller, you have the SEC, and of course you have the state of New York and possibly other states as well, all with a finger in the pie of regulation of, of the New York financial market. And all of them are very legalistic and, and uh, you know, if you've broken the rule, you broke the rule, and if you didn't, you didn't, and so you get quite a bit of, of legal back and forth on this as opposed to, I would say, a very powerful regulator calling up the president of the firm or whatever and saying, you know, uh, what okay, you're doing is, is inappropriate, stop it. And, and they do it. Well, they do, they do. They, they, they are, you know, nobody jerks around with the FSA. Okay. Um, this is for all of you gentlemen. It seems like the future of the U.S. competition and growth ultimately hinges on our ability to produce an educated workforce. What lessons do the countries, um, the, the countries that you have looked at have for the U.S. education system? Is there, any, is there anything about um, the education systems in those countries that we uh, might learn from? Well, I think one thing in the... In in the case of Japan, first of all, is that Japan has had relatively equal income and that you haven't had as many, as many families in as much economic trouble as you find in the United States. So just in terms of looking at, you know, earlier we said, you know, well, there's teachers and there's parents. Well, I mean, parents, uh, parents haven't had as hard a time as, as American parents on, on the bottom end. So that's been, that's been very important. Uh, it's also important that, that Japan has been better at uh, keeping a hold of not uh, not just preparing the, the the best and the brightest, but but preparing the kids kind of in the middle, bottom, middle, uh, the, keeping them in high school, uh, having them having everybody, almost everyone, learn some basic, some have some solid math skills at a level that we don't have in the United States. So I think that's that's been important for Japanese success in, in the ways that they've had. Yeah, I'll, I'll say something. Uh, well, I, I think that a, an educated uh, workforce is certainly a, a necessary condition, but I think the German experience shows it's not a sufficient one. Uh, Germany does have a, a very um, well-trained um, population. Uh, a lot of people go to the university, very high level of degrees, very extensive vocational training system. It's simply not enough, and there are simply structural problems. Uh, in the way in the, the science system, higher education, finance, uh, that show that actually uh, an educated workforce is not a sufficient condition. Well, it's hard to say very much good about the British education system, but there is maybe one point that can be made, and that is that, um, and I go back to a question raised earlier, that uh, the fees for parents are quite modest at Oxford and Cambridge, and that's also true at Trinity College Dublin and the University of Dublin, which are very good uh, colleges. And so, whereas we're getting a system which is really promoting the uh, the elite class, T. N. Srinivasan is doing his best in that. I mean, Yale is basically inaccessible to your average family. Uh, that's not true of Oxford or Cambridge, and so that, that in fact, is a plus. You know, I wonder if I could interject my own question here, and, and it's really an empirical question because I know we all would, would hope this is not true, but is there, is there an inevitable trade-off between a system that brings everybody up to a certain standard, um, that is, that doesn't, that doesn't allow people at the bottom to stay at the bottom, is there a trade-off for that and uh, an education system that, uh, like ours, where the people who do get to, to the top get a probably a better education um, if they make it to Yale, if they make it to Harvard, if they make it um, 
to MIT, uh, they'd probably get a better education, but that we, we, uh, we sort of have a superstar uh, mentality toward education. Is, 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 is there inevitably a trade-off there? And if there is a trade-off, which from, term, from the perspective, not a socialist perspective, but from an economic perspective, is the better, is the better model to have? Uh, well, clearly, I mean, partly if you just look at spending, uh, that we spend more of our money on, on higher education and less of it on, on the, the lower grades than mm -hmm. in Japan or, or European countries, and we've had a higher growth rate. Uh, we, uh, we, I mean, of course, this is partly also Im immigration, in a sense, kind of reinforces this, this trend right. because we bring in very talented, to very talented, bright people, and we bring in a lot of very low-skilled people, and that, that it, it exacerbates the, the, the tendency to, to, to uh, big numbers at the outliers, mm -hmm. very talented and very unskilled components of our population. Uh, it, is, it is a trade-off. It's, it's sort of, Japan has looked at that trade-off and, and moved more in that direction, I think, and Europe has been pulled towards that as well, as, as at the same time that there's been a lot of political angst about, about the results. Well, there, there, there very well may be a trade-off, as you suggest, Steve. What I would point out is that uh, the countries which have traded off the most are in Latin America. When you look at the amount that goes to the higher universities in Latin America and what goes to the primary, it's, it really makes us seem quite egalitarian, and uh, it doesn't seem to be paying off there. And I would, I would also say that both China and Japan have excellent top universities. I mean, they're just right at the top of the top, so there's no quality lack for that small fraction who can get to those top places. It, it might be that for a developing country, you want to certainly try to get everybody up to a certain level. Once you get there, then for an industrialized country, it may be that a different strategy um, uh, is important. Um, this is from Hugh Schwartz of the University of the Republic of Uruguay, speaking of Latin America. Um, to what ex or the southern hemisphere? To what extent have countries with long experience of relatively high per capita income and social benefits to skilled workers and the middle class avoided the possible cost of those policies in terms of the international competitiveness of local industries um, by establishing tax-free zones that have attracted internationally competitive invest in investment? Um, this happened in Uruguay, says Hugh. Has it happened in France and Germany? Could you explain that once again? To what extent? Uh, to what extent? Question, I guess is whether Germany and France have established tax-free zones is that the question? Well, I guess have have they they have any experience of with it and does it work? No, tax-free zones. Um, I that I'm not so familiar with. Uh, certainly, there have been. They've tried to. Um, implement for, for a, a while certain um, policies to help the eastern states in Germany. Uh, but uh, I've never... It does it work? No. No. no, it didn't work, not in East Germany. But um, uh, the question is a very good one. I, I think that there actually is a trade-off between uh, vocational training in these older industries and then efforts to, to nurture new ones. Well, the, the most successful example examples of uh, this uh, high social safety net and uh, you know high uh, public uh, involvement and uh, a successful economy are the Nordic countries, which I think speaks to their uniqueness. And I spent some time in Sweden, uh, which I think is the foremost of these. I mean, Sweden's you know the percent of GDP which is run to the government is still about forty-five percent. Um, Swedish uh, leaders. Uh, such as the Wallenbergs, whom I know, and some of the others, they are very loyal to that culture. And while they could move elsewhere and probably earn more money at the executive level, and I've talked with these guys, they like Sweden. They like their culture. They like their country. They're very loyal. They're not going to move down to the UK or someplace else. So that's, that's extremely strong. The other thing they do in Sweden, apart from drawing on that loyalty, is that for Swedish multinational corporations, the tax system is extremely favorable in the sense of they have high rates, but credits, you know, which basically zeroed out for investment and so forth. 
But, you know, that's very... France and Germany have not succeeded in duplicating that. Though Ireland had a very interesting wrinkle on this, uh, Gary, which you might want to talk about, which is that there is a essentially no taxes or very low taxes on royalties from um, uh, patents and, and other um, licensing of, of, uh, of uh, intellectual property. As a result, Microsoft has shifted a lot of their operations, including a lot of their R&D operations, and by the way, a lot of their patents, over to Ireland to run it through their Irish subsidiary. But they also are creating new ta uh, patents there because they know that the, it will be better to create them there than anyone else, anywhere else from a financial standpoint. Does that work? Well, yeah, it worked for Ireland. How much it would work for other countries remains to be seen because nobody has, has tried it. I should mention one one important statistic, which kind of is a tip to the supply side school, uh, Ireland collects a bigger percentage of um, GDP in corporate tax than any other European country, even though the rate is very low. Um, but of course, there's all that foreign direct investment and so forth. What you say about royalty taxation is absolutely right. They've signed treaties and so forth, so that what in part this does is lead to a lot of tax abuse. There's no doubt about it. There's a lot of tax abuse as well as genuine innovation and so forth, but it is extremely friendly from a tax standpoint to all intellectual property, whether generated in Ireland <coughs> or brought from other countries and then royalties paid out of Ireland. Um, this question is from Bill Donnelly of the United States International Trade Commission, I think. That's USITC. How does the infrastructure in Germany, France, UK, Ireland, and Japan compare to that with the US? Um, and uh, if there is a infrastructure deficit here, how might the US address that? Broadband is um, one factor of that that the bill asked for, but uh, any other that you can think of? What about how, how does our infrastructure um, uh, compare? Uh, well, First of all, on, on broadband, Japan, uh, Japan, South Korea have, have, uh, have had a public support for, for developing really excellent um, uh, broadband networks. Uh, there's, a, there's also criticism that maybe the money was, was, was poor, poorly spent, and maybe it's, it's just as well to, to wait and let, let, uh, let private firms figure out what sells and what really works the best. And, those, are, those arguments are fairly persuasive. Uh, Japan, if anything, I mean, the, 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 has had a, a political, a huge political push in the 1990s as a way to, as a way to, to, to try to reflate the economy. Uh, what has been called excessive investment in, in infrastructure, too much uh, 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 road building, etc. Uh, so I don't think I don't think that's a model to, to look at. Mark. Yeah, an obvious deficit in the U.S. is uh, passenger rail, and we on the East Coast know that. And it's, uh, and it's not just the Northeast. If you've been to Miami, I mean, there's no city in the world that is so beautifully designed for a subway system as Miami is, because all of the industry is basically on one street, both in Miami Beach and in Miami. So for mass transit and passenger rail, that's obviously... Uh, a, a major problem that uh, needs to be tackled, and it probably will be tackled. I heard Michael Takakis, uh, in fact, just talking about that uh, last week. Uh, but it would take uh, initiative by a number of state governors, and that's why I mentioned rail transport on my last slide. Well, did, did, it, in, in Europe, uh, there was some standard setting and investment in terms of uh, telecom, for example. Um, billions poured into a technology. Did, did they pour it into the wrong technology, and is that a big danger if, if we're talking about in, infrastructure that's of a, of, a, of a new age sort? Is there, is there a problem there? If you, if you pick the wrong technology, you're sort of stuck with it, and it's better to let, as uh, Mark uh, Tilton says, it's better to let the marketplace pick the technology. Uh, certainly in telecom, uh, they didn't pick the wrong technology, but they, they charged an awful lot for those uh, 3G licenses. Uh -huh. I mean, that was the big problem that, that you had in, right. in Germany. They charged a lot in Britain, too. And uh, we may have to wait 10 years uh, for all the dust to settle on that. But it did help the, uh, the, the government receipts. Uh, one, one thing I'd mentioned about uh, 
London, which emulates Singapore, but when it's done in Singapore, we can't uh, really translate it, but when it's done in London, we should, and that is the, uh, the, uh, the very sophisticated system for taxing vehicles coming into London. Now, they don't have, they can't build any more anymore than we can build in downtown D.C. or New York, but they really use the transportation system efficiently, and as far as I can see, that's not even being debated here, but it's, it is a model of getting the best out of your transportation infrastructure. Uh, can you tell me when, when we're... Um, we can take a couple more questions. A couple more, okay. Um, this is an interesting question. Um, what kinds of labor and health care policies do these countries employ? And are these policies encouraging or discouraging to economic growth? In uh, France and Germany, I think it's pretty clear to everyone, even if even to the politicians, though may, they may deny it publicly, that uh, labor market policies are uh, almost catastrophically uh, inflexible. And that, that's that's pretty well known. Uh, the health system and also the pension systems are the swords of of Damocles that's hanging over the heads of these countries. Uh, in Japan, uh, everyone has health insurance. It certainly is something that makes it less, uh, makes it more easily for poor families to, to uh, raise children that will be successful. Uh, on labor policy, Japan's big problem is, is a corporate culture that is oriented towards permanent employment. It makes it very difficult to go in and out of the labor market. Therefore, for women, that means choosing, essentially, have kids or, or, or have a career, one or the other. It's an area where the United States has, has a big advantage in having a more flexible, uh, more flexible career structure, and Japan has not figured out how to, how to do that. I think this holds to a great degree for, for old Europe as well. Yeah, both, in, uh, both in the UK and Ireland, um, they've approached the US while you still have much higher nominal union membership, the strident unions of the 60s and 70s are a thing of the past in both countries. The labor force is very flexible. Uh, the UK, of course, has a health service, which is a national health service, which uh, even the conservatives did not try to abolish once there it's kept. But what they, the way they deal with the problem is just rationing, straight out rationing. And I'll just give one little example of how that works in practice because I ran into an entrepreneur in France who runs a hip replacement 